Well, welcome to our second presentation um, during our Lenten journey. And one of the things that we tried to um, stress last week is that our whole journey is about transformation. And yet Lent invites us to stand back and look at where we are as we continue that transformation journey. It's an ongoing journey, so we're never finished. So uh, what I'd like to do is um, ask you to look at the desert time on the green sheet. If you did not get a green sheet, there might be a couple on the chairs back there. Any green sheets floating around? I'd like for you just to take a moment and maybe reflect a little bit on what spoke to you last week or what you've kind of carried this week and just to read the reflection on desert time to yourself quietly and that'll be our opening prayer. So last week we looked at some of the elements of this transformation journey and I got through all of them but one which was a very important one and that was the one on suffering so I'd like to just kind of start with that and then lead into uh, today's content. It seems to me that the greatest role of suffering is to teach us hope. And often when we think of suffering, we think of the book of Job, uh, where he experienced all of these things and people kept asking him where he had sinned, where he had done wrong. He kept saying, I've done nothing wrong. But I think the whole meaning of Job's story is uh, more towards the end, when he's been asking uh, God all kinds of questions and finally God begins to respond and said to Job, you know, where were you when I formed the earth? Where were you when I set this in place, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And the more that God questions Job, the quieter Job gets. And finally, Job just gets very quiet. And I always say that Job had to bow before the mystery, a mystery that he could not give concrete answers to, and yet a mystery that is very, very important in our life. I think if we start off and ask the question, why suffering, it becomes a dead end. I think it's a mystery to be lived rather than a problem to be solved. And it yeasts us, it, it yeast us in a way that leads to power and glory, in, in a way that nothing else does. And what I would invite you to do is just to ask yourself the question, what have I learned from the, my suffering in my own life? Remember last week, we talked um, the importance of life experience. And we have to keep going back to that as adults. We've got to ponder our life experiences because that's how we learn. That's how we come to know. That's how we can uh, move into actions in our life. And so what have you learned? Uh, think of a time in your life which is over, that you've passed through some suffering. Could you say that that is something that I would never have chosen but I learned something. Something happened to me that I have to claim as good, that I have to claim as gift, and yet I would never have chosen it myself. It seems to me that suffering comes from life. We don't choose it. It happens to us just as we try to live our life. And the, I think the important call is to not to run away from it. Uh, there are two questions that I'd like to ask, um, and that is, um, often I think, and, and next week I'll do a little bit more with this on just looking at how Jesus walked this transformation journey. But I'd like to ask the question, because I think we have not done a service to our people when we stress the importance of Jesus dying on the cross. I think that's important, but the image that we often get is that God demanded, God the Father demanded that Jesus do this. And I don't think that's helps us very much. So I'd like to invite us to ask two questions. Why did Jesus die and why was Jesus killed? Jesus was killed, Caiaphas says, he's a, he's a threat to the nation. It's better than one man die than the whole nation perish. So that's Caiaphas's answer. Why did Jesus die? I think Jesus died because he made the decision to remain faithful to the vision to the passion that he had for life. He had to know that if he was going up to Jerusalem, he was really asking for trouble. And yet it would, he would have denied something very important in his life if he had not remained faithful to the vision 
to the passion that was his life. I think that takes us on a whole different route than if we just keep stressing Jesus died for our sins. I, don't say, I didn't say that's not true. I'm just saying I think the emphasis is on what motivated Jesus, what motivated him to keep at it. And then um, when we look at suffering, I think suffering is probably the most important element of this conversion journey. The suffering of being human, of being a finite being, with, let's say, infinite longings. You know, we, we come smack up against the fact that I cannot control. And if I cannot control, the invitation is, can I let go and trust and allow God to lead me, rather than my trying to lead? We're very good at trying to lead. And we get into all kinds of trouble. Because it takes a lot of trust, it takes hope, to really follow God's spirit, rather than lead God's spirit. There are, I think, are two forces within us. The force that seeks life, and also, sin also lives in me. And we looked at that last week. Sin is saying no to love. Sin is trying to say no to life. Although, we don't think about it that way. But what, what gives us life? Jesus said, I came to bring life and life to the fullest. So what am I in slavery to? What am I, where am I looking for security? rather than be willing to risk a little bit. God does not rescue us from our suffering, but he doesn't cause it either. Life happens, and the fact that life is not perfect, the fact that we, we are both gifted and broken, as we said last week, we're going to experience suffering. Things are not perfect. And I think it's important to rescue, uh, to, to look at the fact that God doesn't rescue us but Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to pick up your cross and follow me. He didn't promise to take the cross away. He just said, I'm going to walk with you because I've, I've done this journey. And, and the outcome, we, we name resurrection. But we can't experience resurrection without a lot of dying. And so there's a lot of little dyings and resurrections in our life before we get to the final, our final death and our final resurrection. It's interesting to me that Jesus hanging on the cross was very, very human. Because in his suffering, he cries out, if it be possible, let this suffering pass from me. Take this away. And he doesn't get an answer. So God the Father does not rescue him. But he makes that final act of hope, that final act to choose life without knowing what was going to happen in his humanity. And he said then, not my will, but your will be done. So again, that final act of trust, which is what you and I are going to have to do at our moment of death, is to make that final act of trust without fully understanding everything. We like to understand everything because then we think we can control it. See, we're, we're very good at controlling. We all know that, don't we? We have, to, we have to admit to that. Because if I'm in charge, then I'm trying to determine how all this is going to happen, how all this is going to work itself through. And God keeps inviting us to let go and let God take the lead here. So that moves us into uh, week two, building on week one. And uh, that's on your green sheet. I just put some couple ideas on your green sheet um, to keep me in some kind of order, too. But I'd like to invite you for a moment to look at the three statements at the top of your page, because that's what we want to look at today. And all of these quotes point to the same truth, what I call the process of becoming like God, or the process of becoming our true selves, or the process of choosing divinity. And that kind of, we don't really feel comfortable with that sometimes, but I think that's God's message to us through Jesus. Jesus emptied himself of his divinity to take on the fullness of our humanity so that we might learn that we are to empty ourselves to take on the divinity, which is ours. 
We didn't do anything to earn it. We have it. It's, it's our birthright. You know, when, when Genesis tells us that we are created in God's image and likeness, what does that mean to you? Some people call it the imago dei, the image of God. In us, before we did anything, it's there. It's our birthright. And we can't lose it. So God doesn't love us because we're good. God loves us because of the image that God put in each of us, the total goodness that was there. Sometimes I think that um, that's our eternal essence. That's the, that's the true image of who you and I are and everybody else. And we forget that sometimes. We've got to honor it in us before we are able to honor it in other people. And we pick and choose who we're going to honor it in. But everybody, everything, everybody was created by a God who is total goodness, who is total love. So it's almost like saying evolution, begin in love and it ends in love. And somehow we know that, but not really. If you look at all the poems and all the songs and all the treatises that have been written on love, you know, we talk a lot about it. But the essence of God is love. And so that's just another name for God, I think. And how do you define love? What does love mean to you? I think, and we said this last week, that one of the hardest people to love is ourselves. And if we can't love ourselves, we really can't love God. And if we can't love ourselves, we certainly can't love other people. One of the things that we said last week that I want to repeat, because I think it, it, it's very important here, is that the greatest temptation that you and I will ever have is not to become the person that God created me to be. And I, I just ask you to keep saying that to yourself. Because we often want to be somebody else. We see somebody else that we think is really gifted. And I, if, I, if I could be them. And God keeps saying, I want you to be you. The Sufis, which is the mystical part of Islam, says that each person is a face of God. Each person is a face of God. But we hide it, don't we? And we saw this in the garden story last week. I think that um, garden story, the creation story for us, is really important. And we've kind of looked at it and put it off to the side and said, oh, that's for children. No, I think that's for adults. If you look at, at, go back and read that carefully, God was very intimate with Adam and Eve. They walked lovingly together in the garden. They didn't know they were naked. They were, they were just, nothing was hiding who they were until they tried to be God. Not like God, there's a difference. We're, we're called to be like Christ, who is God. We're called to be like God, but we are not the God. We're not the one in charge. And when they do that, then it says that they put on fig leaves. They begin to hide who they are. So something happened there that um, put things out. We call it original sin. But what I'd like to pose to you is, what I call, or Matthew Fox calls, original blessing. Our original blessing is that you and I were made in God's image. We are made in God's image. And that, that is our essence. That's the original blessing. And I think that we have to continue to keep letting ponder that so that can go deeper. What happened, I think, if we look at history, is that when we get to the third and fourth century, we've got Augustine. And Gusson's all about redemption. Gusson's all about the original sin that upset the apple cart, so to speak. And we've been raised on redemptive theology. And I think that we need to go back and, and collect and correct and say the original blessing is that you and I are made in God's image and likeness. And this likeness God keeps trying to cultivate. But God has given us a free will because you can't force love. And who knows better than that but God? You have to freely choose love. 
And so God keeps inviting us, he never gives up, to claim the essence that is within each of us. And what happens is we keep putting on masks, we keep hiding who we are, and I think as Adam and Eve put on fig leaves, we've done the same thing. And what you and I have to do is to begin to take off those fig leaves so that we can stand truly who we are, both gifted and broken, both gifted and sinner, and, and hold that paradox and believe that if I cooperate with God's grace, that God can heal that. But that's a whole process. That's a lifelong journey. And different spiritual writers have talked about it using different terms, but they're really saying the same thing. So Merton talks about the true self and the false self. The journey of the false self, we have to let go of who we are not so that we can become who we are, so we can grow into that true self, which is a lifelong journey. And as we said last week, Lent continues to invite us to renew that journey, to go out into the desert, to take time, and to listen to God's spirit as Jesus listened to God's spirit. So if we're made in the image and likeness of God, the image refers to our personal and unique embodiment of this humanity and divinity together. You and I are called to incarnation just as Jesus was called to incarnation. We are called to incarnate in our human body that image, that imago dei of God. That's our job. But in our human body, not in Mary's or Sam's or somebody else that we think um, would be better to be, we have to claim our own identity, our own incarnation. And we in all creation are made in God's image and likeness. Many times, you know, we know this um, indirectly. If you ask people, where do you most sense God? They'll often go back to creation. And, and somebody has said, well, creation is really our first gospel. And I think it is. So just to allow all things that have been God created. And God said, that's good. If you go through the, the, the um, creation story, everything that God created is good. That's the original blessing. It's we who kind of mess things up. But we have to come to a gradual awareness of this gift. And until we become aware, we're not very good at making uh, choices, good choices. So awareness is, a, is an important step. Become more aware of some of these things that we looked at last week and, and looking at this week. We'll never get it fully. We have to continue this journey. We have to deepen. Remember we said that our, our journey is spiral. It's not linear. So there's a lot of up and downs, but we're always called to go a little deeper into this awareness. And once we become more aware, then we can more guide our, our decisions. And so, you know, we're called to choose life. But that means that we've got to ponder and contemplate, where is life in this? And that's not an easy question either, to try to determine what is the most life-giving thing that I can do at this moment. There are many ways to manifest God, and yet the Sufis remind us that each one of us is a face of God. And together, we can mirror the goodness. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything, but again, as we've witnessed the tragedy uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, we also witness the goodness of people. You know, the, the suffering, the tragedy, etc., somehow taps into the goodness of people. People are, feel called to do something. And um, it's too bad that it takes a situation like that, but we, we witness that over and over again. So transformation invites us to go deeper in ourselves, to touch the divine indwelling that's within each of us, to, to move towards that union ever so small that Adam and Eve had in the beginning. No mask, or letting go of the mask. You know, the word um, mask comes from the Latin word persona, and persona means to put on a mask. And so we, we have a lot of different masks that we uh, put out there for different people in our lives. So what, what is the true self? What is the better self? 
what is the real self that's trying to break through? Not completely. Paul tells us in Colossians, the mystery of Christ is within you, your hope of glory. So going back to that statement by Irenaeus, that the glory of God is a human being fully alive. The glory, the presence of God, that's what glory means. The presence, the full presence of God is a human being fully alive. You and I are not fully alive yet. We're in process, <laughs> which is okay, as long as we're trying to make decisions for life, as long as we're trying to be open to where God wants us to lead rather than we trying to lead God. There was a book that came out um, a few years ago entitled Your God is Too Small. And, you know, we try to make God in our image and likeness. That poses a lot of problems. Um, and I think it's important to kind of dwell on that because when you and I are in prayer, we, ha we hold a certain image of God. And that guides how we uh, try to connect with God. And our image is often way too small. One of the images that the book deals with is, is seeing God as a policeman, just waiting to catch us. What a terrible image. How can, how can we really relate to that in an intimate, loving way? But if we look at Jesus, who becomes the visible image of this invisible God, we see Jesus calling his father Abba, a very intimate term, Father. And I'm told that going down the streets of Jerusalem sometimes, you can hear little kids calling after their father, Abba, Abba. Beautiful term. Who is God for you? Who is this God that you try to relate to? It makes, it's really important that you look at that image for, or images of yourself because your images will change. But if we look at Jesus and we listen to his stories and we listen to the people that he, he is able to touch, he often is not able to touch the sophisticated, those who have all the answers, those who are well-educated. But he's able to touch those on the margins of society because I think they know that they can't do it by themselves. They've learned that lesson. I think they know what it means to call Jesus Savior. I think they know that they can ache for this healing, but it has to come from our God rather than we try to heal ourselves. So again, what is your image of God? You know, we're always searching for God, or many times we are, and yet the trouble is God's already here. We're the ones that are not here. We're someplace else, or we're searching for God in the wrong places. If, if God's image is within us, if we're made in the imago dei, the image of God within us, then God is here. We're over there someplace, or looking in the wrong place. And we've got to get back to touching in. I think I would invite you, it seems to me that when we grow in prayer, we grow into be, trying to become more quiet, to embrace solitude. And often words get in the way. What would happen if this week you just made the practice of just trying to sit in God's presence, which means if God is here, you're just trying to sit and be aware right here, right now, that this is where God is. Now, this is not the only place God is. We've got to touch that first and just kind of listen. It's hard for us in this chaotic, busy world. It's hard for us to get quiet. And that's a scary part of the desert, which that article points out, because we have to face ourselves. And that's not, that's not easy. But God already knows us. He's waiting for us to come to know who we are. He's waiting for us to come to see. He keeps loving us. We can't fall out of God's love. We think we can, we act like we can, but we can't. Because God cannot not help loving us because of the image of God that is within us. So it's two negatives there, but it, it, it gets back to the essence of who we are. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, ask you to think about a couple things here. And that is that um, Gandhi, you know, was intrigued by the New Testament. 
And he read and studied it, and then he asked the question, show me where this is lived. That's a scary question, isn't it? Show me where this is lived. It's a great challenge to us. And then G.K. Chesterton, an English writer, made this statement. He said, the trouble with Christianity is it hasn't been tried yet. There's some, there's some truth in both of these. The trouble with Christianity is it has not been tried yet. Our outer world and our inner world have got to come together. That's, that's the paradox that we have to hold together until it begins to be integrated. It's a process. It's not going to happen overnight. But until our outer world, the way we live, the way we act, and those things that we are passionate about, those things that we say we believe, until they come together, we're not going to have wholeness, which means we're not going to have holiness. Holiness and wholeness are the same words. Again, it's a process. So there's an absolute connection between how we see God and how we see ourselves and the whole universe. So think about that. Our family of origin is divine. That's the main message that we have today. We were created by a loving God. This world was created by a loving God. That's our original blessing. And we have to keep trying to move back to that. What I want to do, well, I wanted to do it last time, and now I'm, I look at about three minutes. I'd like to invite you to either comment, reflect, or ask a question either from last week or this week. What's, what's speaking to you? What's, what's your thought on some of this? We learn from each other. I don't have all the answers, of course. This is when classes always get quiet. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, it, it is all process. And sometimes we get tired. Yes. And the difficulty of seeing God in ourselves and in others. Right, that's, right. That's, to me, that's, that's a lifelong conversion process. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that means our enemies too, doesn't it? That's right. That's right. And, and, that, and that's, where, that's where we get stretched. And that's, that's where we have to really depend on God healing to help us. You know, if you look at Matthew 25, which is a familiar passage, I'm sure, to all of you, you know, it's the last judgment. And it's all about being aware of all the other people in your life. When we fed, when we gave drink, when we visited the prison, et cetera, et cetera. You, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. That's how, we, that's how we truly love our God, is by loving all the creatures that God has created, even those that we cannot see. So there's some way we've got to start seeing with God's eyes, the eyes that are back here, down here, when we look at, look at some of this. Some other thoughts. Right, right. Okay, uh, Diane's telling us our time is up. Uh, I, 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 know, I know that many of you have to go back to where you came from, so, but if anybody wants to continue for a couple minutes, I'll stay here, so.